Carlyle is one of Britain's top legal experts as well as being a Liberal Democrat member of the House of Lords. The vice chair of the all-party parliamentary group on genocide and crimes against humanity here in Britain. He, amidst other legal experts, are worried about the International Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh. The tribunal has been trying individuals accused of war crimes during the 1971 War of Liberation. Many have accused the tribunal of being used as a political tool. As the tribunal continues, the latest of developments includes that of UK-based Chaudhry Moinuddin. The community leader has been tried in absentia and sentenced to death after being found guilty of crimes related to the abduction and killing of independence supporters. Lord Carlyle recently wrote a letter to the United Nations damning the International Crimes Tribunal and calling for action from the international community. Speaking to him last week, he told me more. I have been concerned about one issue in Bangladesh, which is the uh, War Crimes Tribunal. And uh, over a considerable period now, I've been looking at, scrutinising the way in which that tribunal has been operating. And in particular, I've been, in particular, I've been looking to see whether it satisfies fair trial standards. I should say that I'm very much in favour of war crimes being prosecuted and I was involved in and instrumental in the uh, passing of the War Crimes Act in this country. So I have absolutely no opposition to the trying of war criminals. However, if people are to be tried for war crimes, which were often committed a very long time ago, we have to ensure that they have the same standards of justice as are available for any other crime. I am quite satisfied that the Bangladesh um, war crimes defendants have not had proper standards of justice by international norms. Um, the trials have been characterised by witness intimidation, lawyer intimidation, interference by the government in the judicial process, and the use of the death penalty, which uh, in this country and throughout the countries of the Council of Europe we no longer favour, indeed we are strongly opposed to. Uh, I believe that these war crimes tribunals are fueling political unrest in Bangladesh. Um, I've had some real-time contact with people who've been literally, as I've spoken to them, in demonstrations in the country, in Dhaka, and uh, I have a huge level of concern. I should add that I do not speak only for myself. I speak for um, a group of lawyers and parliamentarians with considerable knowledge of Bangladesh, some of whom have evidential knowledge of the cases concerned. Interference in the court has been an issue raised by human rights groups all over the world. This includes the American human rights group Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. The abduction of key witness Sukhra Bali in the case of Delwar Hussein Sayyidi was but one example. People in the international community, like myself, like other UK parliamentarians and lawyers, have protested at the way in which these trials have been conducted. The international organisations have not shown much courage in doing so, and I single out for criticism the United Nations. Um, in my view, the United Nations has been supine in its approach to the, this situation and has failed to criticise the Bangladesh government in the way the, the government deserves. What should the United Nations be doing? Well, I think the United Nations should be doing much more than simply saying, I've written to the Bangladesh government expressing concern about the use of the death penalty, which is uh, all I have seen recently in response to a letter that I wrote to the United Nations. I think that the United Nations should be taking action um, through its debating facilities in New York to ensure that what is happening in Bangladesh in these tribunals is drawn to the attention of the international community and can receive the condemnation it deserves from the international community. I have a real concern, and this is not just based on Bangladesh, about the effectiveness of the United Nations in this kind of situation. The UN is generally very good at human, humanitarian aid, at uh, in organising help on the ground, but it's becoming weaker and weaker at dealing with governments which are recalcitrant and act improperly, even in the legal sphere, as is the case with Bangladesh. And this is really feeding 
the appetite for intervention in countries like the United States and the United Kingdom, where there is now frustration that the United Nations is not functioning as the international organisation it's supposed to be. The first indictments from the International Crimes Tribunal were issued in 2010, and major figures from opposition parties were almost immediately arrested. With an election looming and tensions rising, I asked Lord Carlyle as to whether time was running out. Time is running out and I'm afraid I have very little optimism that the death penalty will not be carried out. Um, and of course if the death penalty is carried out then when the next government comes into office and it's likely to be the current opposition, then there's every chance we'll see the sort of revenge which is being exacted um, now. I mean, I do hope that the opposition would subscribe more readily to human rights norms and particularly to justice norms. Um, I mean, if I can just give you some basic points, cross-examination on the part, part of defendants' lawyers has been curtailed. Defendants have not been permitted to call witnesses who could, for example, give them evidence of alibi that they were somewhere else at the time when the alleged crime was committed, as in, in a different country. Um, and, and also there has been clear evidence of the intimidation of defence lawyers. That's wholly unacceptable. Most offensively, there is now evidence that the tribunal sent at least one of its draft judgments to the government for consideration and approval before it handed down the judgment, because there is an email string available that demonstrates that. That's just monstrous. Um, the, 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 if that is happening, then the whole notion of the separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary, so essential in a democracy, is being abandoned. Now, the death penalty in Bangladesh, this is something that um, is actually a part of the law. It's not something that, against, that is against the law. Should there be a differentiation with the International Crimes Tribunal? Do you think that this actually should be taken out of the Constitution wholly? Well, I mean, I believe that Bangladesh should abandon the death penalty. There's absolutely no evidence that having the death penalty makes your country a more, a more law-abiding country at all. Um, but I recognise that there are cultural differences, and in many countries in South Asia, the death penalty has been in existence and has been used historically. My, my issue, really, about the death penalty in these war crimes cases is that it's absolutely clear that some of the people who've been convicted may not be guilty. And this is a mistake you can't undo. And so, in my view, there is a real risk that innocent people will be hanged as uh, examples um, and that we will discover in a few years' time not only that they were unfairly tried, which we know, but that actually there was a trumped-up case against them that purported identification evidence was untrue, even paid for, um, and uh, I do not believe that there can be a civilised person in the world who is comfortable with the death penalty being carried out when the jurisdiction is so poor. We saw um, a change in verdict in some of these cases where we saw life sentences and, and, and then that's changed to, a death, to the death penalty. Um, is, that, is that highlighting direct interference with the courts? One of the issues that really concerns me about some of these death penalties is that they are retrospective in the sense that the law has been changed after conviction to enable the death sentence to be passed, which could not have been passed during the trial. Now, there is nothing more offensive to politicians and jurists than the retrospective imposition of a penalty. Never mind the death penalty. You know, if something is not punishable with imprisonment and retrospectively imprisonment is imposed, that's very offensive. The retrospective imposition of the death penalty is an absolute outrage. Nobody in the family of nations can condone that. Um, it might happen in Iran, and I doubt that the government of Bangladesh really wants to be compared, um, unfavourably even, with the government of Iran. You mentioned earlier that um, we're likely to see revenge on the other side if the BNP are to get into power, but will they be able to undo all of the things that the Awami League have done? Well, they won't be able to undo any death sentences, that's for sure. Um, uh, 
The BNP will no doubt be able to undo some of the more offensive laws passed by the Awami League. But you know, th- is that really the way they want to run the country? Um, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in country, democratic countries around the world, laws do change. It's one of the truisms of politics that the dirty work of any government is done by its predecessor. Um, but what we have here is a sort of pendulum democracy, and it's a very big pendulum. So when there's a change of government, the pendulum swings whoop, to the opposite extreme. And it really doesn't provide stability of government for the country. Now, what matters most for the stability of the country is a strong economy. And what happens second most is that which gives rise to a strong economy, which is a stable political system in which people can predict how they will be leading their lives after a change of government. Nobody can predict what life will be like if there is a change of government from the Awami League to the BNP.